<laughs> Amen. Wow. The youth uh, secret, how to stay young. Actually, it's on aisle 34 where you can get the color for your hair. That'll start with it. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But, but I, I was amazed. I was amazed. I saw those pictures and pastor on the motorcycle, you know, with, with the shorts. Hallelujah. And out there baptizing. And I, he's my hero. Praise God. So excited about that. I am so glad to have this opportunity to be with you on this wonderful occasion. Thank you, pastors, for allowing me to be here and to share on this. This is wonderful. Amen. 22 years. Hallelujah. That's, that, that's, uh, that's special. That's special. It's special to see that God has had people that are faithful, and we've been singing and studying that God is faithful, and we thank God for His faithfulness, and it's not over yet. Isn't that good? Amen. This is just the beginning. 22 years, and if God tarries, we've got an eternity to uh, celebrate. Not only if He tarries, we do have an eternity to celebrate the grace and the power and the glory of God. And, and you may not know it, but I have been a part of you for a long time. Amen. I am a secret member of this church. Hallelujah. So, uh, so you need to know that. Uh, I've, I've been around for 20-something years. In fact, I was around when Philip, in fact, I knew Philip before he got here when he was at Brother Jimmy Swaggart's and uh, Bible College and then here and then I came and uh, met uh, Brother, St Brother Steve and Sister Mary and they, they gave me permission. I was pastoring at that time. Gave me permission to be who God had called me to be. I was pastoring, but I was not a pastor. I didn't have a call to pastor, but I was in a denomination that said, you want a pastor? So I, I believe in being submitted. So I submitted to those people and I pastored, but I came here and Pastor Steve Nolan gave me permission to pursue my calling and my anointing. And that was uh, around 20 something years ago. And that is 44 nations ago that we have the opportunity to minister. So what I want you to know is that this is not just your harvest. And China and those things that I saw there, you have a harvest harvest in 44 nations around the world because you invested in this ministry and I honor you for that. Hallelujah. Well, come on, that's great. Hallelujah. In fact, I, I, I brought one of your grandkids back. You may want to send him back home pretty soon. But, uh, but uh, Austin Anderson, uh, his grandmother and grandfather was one of the first people that came with me to this area. And they got to meet the Nolans and got to be involved in this church. And I think it's significant that now a grandchild has come back. And I believe that you have a whole harvest of grandchildren that are going to come and to be a part of what you're doing and going to go out. And isn't it going to be wonderful? wonderful when we get to heaven and God begins to show us just how far reaching the influence of ministry has been. And so I am so pleased to be here and to be a part of you. I, I feel inadequate I, and you got to know that and I'm a little bit afraid. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm, I'm here with two great preachers I, and I saw all of those preachers that you had and I, when somebody asked me, said, what are you going to, do you have a PowerPoint? And I said, no. And, uh, and they said, uh, you know, do you have a long list of scriptures? And I said, no. And, uh, and, uh, but I have a word. I, I, I do believe I have a word for you and I want to come and just be a part of this great celebration and to give God all the praise. And, and maybe before we get to that word, would you just really make me feel at home by doing this? Can, I know you've stood up a lot. Would you stand up one more time? And would you do this just for me and for God? Would you give Jesus a real hand clap of praise? This is his house, his pulpit. All the glory, Lord, goes to you. You're high, you're lifted up, you're wonderful, you're counsel. Your mighty God, your everlasting Father, your Prince of Peace, your El Shaddai. I worship you. I adore you. I honor you. Hallelujah. And glorify your name. Amen. Amen and amen. You can remain standing for just a minute. Somebody said, why do you do that? Lest we forget. Lest we forget that's what we came for. Lest we forget that's the whole purpose of being here. I, I go to churches all over this world and somewhere we have gotten the idea that church is for us. But church is not for us. Church is not that we sing the song that you like or I preach the message that you want to hear. You see, we need to understand there's an audience of one. And we have all come to honor and to glorify and lift up His name. And He said if He was lifted up, He would draw all men unto Him. This is what God laid on my heart for you today. It's the second chapter of the book of Acts. I want to read starting with that 42nd verse. And the text is simply that first phrase, and they continued. 
they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all that believed were together and had all things common, sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had needs. And so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they did eat their food their food with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those which were being saved. God, I need you. Without your anointing, God, I'm a sounding brass. I'm a tinkling cymbal. Without your anointing, Father God, what I will have to say will fall down at my feet and mean nothing unless you touch them, those words with the fire that burns upon the altar of God. Let me to speak, God, as you would speak. Let me to speak to the hearts of this church about their past, but God, mostly about their future. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I would like to say one other thing before I share with you. I understand that I am here under the covering of your pastors. I'm, I'm a firm believer in submission to authority. And somebody said, why do you say that? I think it needs to be said in churches that in this pulpit while I'm here, if I were to say anything that's contrary to what Pastor Renee or Pastor Jennifer preaches in this pulpit, you don't have to go home and say, was that evangelist right or was the pastors right? Because the pastors will always be right in that situation. Now I'm preaching better than you're shouting. Hallelujah. I said the pastors will always be right. You see, there is power in submission to authority. When we submit ourselves to those in authority, we have authority. And because I want authority in this house today, I want to speak with authority. I gladly lay this ministry that I have at your feet. And if I say anything, you let me know and I will correct it. Amen. By the power and the grace of God. I, I got to tell you how I came about what I want to share with you today. I was asked some time back. I, I have a son that is, uh, has been the youth pastor of our church. He has just moved now into a senior associate position. And uh, he still does a real, a very extremely large youth camp in America. And recently he came to me and he said, hey, dad, I want you to preach my youth camp or one of the services in my youth camp. Now, I'm going to tell you, you're not laughing, and I appreciate that. Hallelujah. That my son would look at me as old as I am. I, I have shoes older than most of you. Amen. Hallelujah. That's how old I am. And to ask me to speak at a youth camp. Now, I, I'm going to tell you, I laugh. That's a laughable situation. What in God's name does a six million, none of your business, your old man... <laughs> have to say to a group of young people what language I mean it would be like me trying to speak Mandarin hallelujah to speak to them and he said no I think that you ought to speak and I said what in what 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 in God's name do you think that I can say to them and he said I want you to tell them what you wish somebody had told you 42 and a half years ago when you started ministry First of all, I can't remember that far back. <laughs> no, I can. That, that, that started the wheels turning. What, what would I wish that I could tell somebody that, that, that I experienced, that I wish somebody had told me 40-something years ago that might be a blessing to them that would keep them from going through some of the things that I've had to go through? And then when I had this opportunity afforded me, I, I asked that same question. I wonder if the church, if we could, if we could somehow or another uh, make the church anthropomorphically uh, uh, a being and ask it the question, what, what would Lighthouse Church say to this generation and to the generations to come what would it say this is what I hope that you have learned this is what I hope that you have received this is what I believe that if you've received you can move to the next generation for we don't know what tomorrow holds but we do know who holds tomorrow I, I wonder what it would say and, and as I begin to ponder I, I've learned lots of things in 42 years. There's been great, wonderful truths, truths of, of faith, uh, truths of, uh, of endurance, truths of a lot of different aspects that I've learned. But I believe if I could reduce down the one thing that I would tell young people or I would tell the church moving into the next generation would simply be this. Continue. No. I didn't expect you to shout. I didn't expect you to get out your notepads and say, let's write that down. There's a profound word for you. No, but I believe that if we'll ponder a minute, we'll realize 
And the most important thing that stands out, I, I, I've, had a, I've had a casual observance of this church over the last 22 years. And I can tell you there's been lots of things that have been learned. They, these pastors could come and tell you great truths uh, of, of, of great and wonderful lofty experiences, the rarefied air of, of the Spirit of God and walking in that anointing. And they, they would talk about that anointing. And, and by the way, they would eventually get around to talking about those low points when it was very difficult to see their hand in front of their face and to make another step. What got you here? How did you get here? And I think somewhere they would simply say, we continued. We continued when we didn't feel like continuing. We continued when we didn't have a word from God, it seemed, uh, to continue. We continued when there was no emotion that drove us forward. See, I, I actually found this out early in my life. If you'll pardon the personal references, I was raised in uh, the southern part of the United States, the deep south, L.A., if you will. And that's not Los Angeles for those of you that are unaccustomed. That's lower Alabama. Hallelujah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> oh, I can tell you've never been there, have you? But let, let me tell you something <laughs> about lower Alabama. Lower Alabama is uh, a little bit native in, its, <laughs> in the way it does things. It's, uh, it's raw, and it still is. And, and they do things, um, some things that are not very refined and refreshed. In fact, they still live by the law of the jungle a lot there, and they sure did when I came through there some 60 and none of your business years old, uh, years ago. But I found out something there. In, in lower Alabama, this law of the jungle said that if you uh, encountered opposition, you don't run your mouth a lot and you don't say a lot because somebody will take you on. Somebody will see if you're really serious. They, they handle things not with reasoning, not with let's discuss it, let's buy a Coke and talk about it. They handle it with their brute force. And so I learned something very early as a young man in lower Alabama. I learned, and please, this is not very spiritual. Just stay with me. I'll get there. They, I, I learned that, that if you get in an encounter, I'm not suggesting you get in an encounter like that. But if you happen to get in an encounter with somebody that's determined to deal with you physically, let me explain something. If you reach back with your greatest amount of strength and energy and you hit that guy right between the eyes, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting you do that. <laughs> but if you do and you hit him with the best shot you've got and you drop him on the floor, can I suggest something to you, those of you that are not familiar with that kind of mentality? Don't start shouting yet. <laughs> Don't start jumping up and down. You have won the fight. Wait a minute. Because if he gets up, and that was your best shot, and especially if he gets up smiling, and that was your best shot, I've got a word for you. You have one way out. Run like crazy. Hallelujah. Because <laughs> that guy's going to kill you. Now you say, what in the world does that have to do with... Acts, the second chapter and the 42nd verse. See, the thing that I have learned is no matter how much faith we have, no matter how much anointing we have, no matter how much of the Word, no matter how much experience we have in Christ, Satan is not going to roll over and play dead. He leaves for a time. Christ went into the wilderness uh, after His baptism and, and was tempted after 40 days of fasting and, and after a great defeat, the Bible said, for a season... The enemy left. The enemy will leave for a season, but I can assure you of this one thing. He's coming back, and he's going to challenge your faith. He's going to stand in your faith to see if you still believe what you believe. And let me tell you, I've got to tell you something. Of 42 years of ministries, there's times that he caught me off guard. He hit me hard with something that I couldn't understand, that I wasn't expecting. I could tell you some of those things. Death of a daughter and other things that I've experienced. And he laid me on the floor spiritually. And then my spirit would say, just stay here. It's not worth getting up again. But you know something? If I stay there, I'm defeated. But if I shake myself and I stand back up on my feet and say, Satan, if that's the best you had, I'm still here. And I'm still serving God. You will drive Him out. Continuing therefore. 
This, 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 this writer of Acts, this, this physician Luke, is telling about how the church was going to maintain what they had learned through Jesus Christ. And he said, you're going to have to understand, you've got to, you've got to continue in some basic elements. You can't stop those things. You never get smart enough or you never get spiritual enough or you never get so powerful that you don't have to go back to these basics. But if you'll go back and continue doing the basics, there's not enough devils in or out of hell. There's not enough problems in or out of hell that can defeat you if you just continue. What, what are those things? First of all, he said con they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And nobody's shouting. Nobody's waving their hand and saying, yes, yes, continuing in the apostles. What does it mean? You see, the apostles' doctrine is actually what became for us the synoptic gospels. They were the teachings of Jesus uh, that his apostles wrote down and they, they, they put into their spirit. It was the word of God. He said, if we're going to be faithful, we've got to understand we have been faithful by continuing in the word in the past and we've got to continue to be faithful in the word in the future. You know what's brought you 22 years? The Word of the living God. The power of God's Word. You know, I really don't think we, we understand as modern Christians, we don't understand what we have when we have the Logos of God, the, the written Word of God, God's Word for you and I. But I think if we ever realize that by imbibing that Word, by taking that Word in, by, by putting that Word into our life, his word, the Bible said, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Let me tell you, one of your greatest weapons against the enemy is the power of the word. And if I would challenge you uh, for 22 more years of greatness, uh, I would challenge you to go back and to reiterate and to reemphasize, I need a lifestyle that is centered in studying to show myself approved a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you need to understand there's power. I, I was pastoring in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I had been in a, a long series of fastings and seeking God and asking God to show me what we were up against. And, and, and there was a revival that was about to come out. But before that revival, during the midst of that fast, I don't know how long I'd been fasting. A number of days. I was weak. We had a large day school in that church. We had about 800 students in our day school. And, and they had a basketball game in the middle of this fasting. And as I was leaving the church, somebody, as usual... It was supposed to lock the door, didn't lock the door, so the pastor has to do all of those chores. And so I was walking across the gymnasium. The green exit lights were shining. All the lights was off to close the back door. Weak because I'd been fasting, seeking direction from God. And about halfway across the gym, there was a flash of someone that came out of the darkness. And they jumped on me from behind. And I saw the knife as it went up this way, as it started down. This was a split second. You know, it seemed, it, it, it acted out. It seemed like it was an eternity, but a split second. And, and I, I realized I have no strength to counteract this. I'm, I'm at a point of complete weakness. How can I deal with this situation? And, and all of a sudden, not here, not have I hid His Word in my mind. That's a good place to start. But you have to get it out of your mind into your spirit. Where the Word of God becomes partial and part of who you are. When all of a sudden, without thinking, without going through the file, saying, now what scripture do I need now for this situation? Way down here. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever had that happen to you? Way down here, it was like a little bubble that escaped from a submarine. That it starts a little bubble, but by the time it reaches the top, it's a very big bubble. Because it's expanded. It started down here, and I heard in my spirit, in your weakness... You shall know my strength. Something happened. Not, not that I worked out. Not that I had all of a sudden become a superman. And surely I'm not brave. This streak down my back is solid gold. But all of a sudden, I took the knife away. Laughed at the person that had determined they would destroy me. And walked out realizing how important it is to continue in the Word of God. I love what you did while ago, Pastor. Let's rehearse those promises. 
Let's rehearse them. To, we're, they're not coming from our head, but they're coming from my heart. For We've got 22 more years or 44 more or 66 more years. And if we're going to get there, it'll be because we continue in the Word of God. Number two, not only do they continue in the Word of God, but the Bible said that they continued in prayers. Oh, come on. Nobody's shouting yet. Well, maybe we're getting there. You see, but so because this is not profound. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I, if you would like for me to promulgate, promulgate my esoteric cogitations and not avoid the use of platitude and ponderosities, we can get to something none of us can understand. Amen. But I, I, I want you to understand that, that these simple truths, the Word and prayer, Prayer is not an option for a church that is 22 years old. The reason there's a church here today, oh, I thank God for your great talented leadership, but the reason there's a church here today is not because of the talent that's been in the pulpit. It's not because of your singers, and it's not because of your building. You're here because somebody in this crowd understands that we have this wonderful gift to be able to pray and to talk to God. We have not, for we ask not. And we ask amiss. We have because we pray without ceasing. Can we pray without ceasing? You better believe it. We can walk in an atmosphere of prayer and communion with God. You see, prayer is not an option. I'm, I'm amazed that, that, that we live in a, a modern Christendom that prayer has become an option. Can, can I give you a statistic? Does, would, that, that okay? Can I share that with you? That evangelical Christianity worldwide, do you know what the average evangelical Christian, how often or how much they pray in a week's time? Less than three minutes. Wait a minute. If that bothers you, it should bother you. Three minutes, and that includes down to lay me down to sleep when I go to sleep. That includes praying grace over meals. That includes formal prayers prayed in the church when you come to worship. And we can only muster a little more than three minutes of prayer. Is it any wonder that in many cases we are powerless? Wait a minute. For you preachers, let me add that. You know how we evangelical dynamic types preaching the Word of God. You want to hear about our prayer life? Less than seven minutes a week. Now, I... I I hope that shocks you. It shocks me. That, that we, that with formal prayers of down to lay me down to sleep, praying grace, praying, praying at funerals, weddings, and at church, and all we can muster is seven minutes a week. No wonder, not here, but worldwide, that the church shows up at 10 o'clock sharp on Sunday and they leave at 12 o'clock dull because no one asked. No one prayed. If I can challenge you to go to the next generation, it would be this. Get under the wing of your leadership and say this, teach me to pray. Teach me to, to seek and to know how to seek and to call upon the name of the Lord because there is power and dynamics. And he said, if we're going to be the church of the living God, we have to be a, a praying seeker. Fellowship in the Word. Prayer. And then fellowship. That third aspect. Now I want to tell you what, you guys have got that down pat here. Hallelujah. Okay, I'll try it over here if they didn't get it. You guys have got fellowship down pat here. Amen. Every time I come to this church, y'all are fellowshipping. Hallelujah. And I like the way you fellowship, and I do appreciate the pastor mentioning that there'll be a meal after this. She knows that's the one way to get me to stop preaching is for the meal. <laughs> So if in a minute, if I'm a little long-winded, somebody will wave the menu, we will stop. <laughs> Amen. But fellowship, what is, what is, you said it a while ago. I, I, I laugh. I'm, I'm amazed at how the Spirit of God confirms words, aren't you? Aren't, aren't, you, aren't you amazed how, that without even talking, and, and you mentioned something about uh, uh, somebody in two, two people in a ship or something like that. I don't know how you said it, but, but when I was sitting over there. Fellowship, what is fellowship? It's two people in a ship. A little disappointing nobody's taking notes <laughs> Two, no no wait let, let me let me let me let me let me try to refine that that definition for you fellowship is two people in the same ship rowing the same direction that that may be a little better that's still not profound enough for you i can see the church is a body of unity our God is a God that does not embrace confusion. 
If we are to be the church of the living God, we have to understand it's not about me and what I want and what I think. It's about when I walk through that door back there, I realize I'm one of many of this fellowship and I surrender my desires and my wishes to the desires and the wishes of the corporate body in Christ that God can work in us as the corporate man. If I'll do that, then my needs will be met. Physical, spiritual, financial, material. But we have to have fellowship. We, we, we are in this together. We, we need to like one another. I'm going to tell you something. I like to be around Christians, don't you? And let, let me tell you, that, that one of the ladies that, that has meant so much to me here is Priscilla and getting to know her. And isn't it wonderful to be around this lady? I mean, she's just bouncing off the wall and stuff. Man, she, she's just bubbling. And, and, uh, and, but you know what? She wraps you in to that, that place that, that you actually feel she cares she wants to be with you. She wants you to be with her. And she wants our togetherness to bring the, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit into the midst. You see, if we're going to be the church, we, we're not just going to be a word church and a praying church. We have to be a fellowship church. We have to love getting along and being together. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. I, I, I go a lot of places today that are, I don't need to go to church. I can, I can be just as good a Christian at the mall as I can at the church. Now, I got a word for you. You lie about that, you'll lie about other stuff. Okay, I'll say it over here because they didn't like that. <laughs> I said, that's not so. There is something that we receive when we come together in faith and in the Word and in prayer that brings strength to us that I can't get anywhere else in the world. I can't get it at the soccer game. I, I can't get it when we're just meeting with friends over coffee. I get it when I come together with those of like precious faith. And the Bible said one should put a thousand, but two, ten thousand. I sat there in weakness this morning, but as you worship, I felt the strength of young lions. I felt strength that I didn't bring with me, Pastor. It was the strength that came from the, the purity of the fellowship. When we come together, we may seem that we're weak along, but the moment we come together, that power begins to multiply. That's why it's important that we come to church and that we fellowship together in the house of God. And if I could challenge you, the church would say, the word, prayer, and fellowship. Continue those things. Continue. I'm not asking you to do something you haven't done. I'm just asking you to do what you've always done, but, but understand why you're doing it. The, the fourth thing, maybe a little bit off here, but not only do we have to continue in word and prayer and fellowship, but this scripture said they continued. Are you ready? I'm, I'm, I'm about to make the religious people a little upset. I'm not a very religious person. Maybe I ought to explain that. Religion is man's effort to find God. I understand religion. But I'm glad 42 years ago I found Christianity, which is God's finding me. I didn't come to seek God. He said He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I don't know about you, I didn't find God 42 years ago. He found me. And He saved me. But this, this, this word here is, they continued in the Word and prayer, and they continued in fellowship, and in fear. <whistles> Wake up. I, I preach in the Gudentang down in South Africa in villages called Mala Malele and Mula Mula. And they do something down there I really like. They whistle. Oh yeah, in worship. It's beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. It shocked me when I first went in and they were, they were all whistling, whistling loud. And, and, and I questioned them and they said, Oh, but pasta, 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 the Word of God said, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Joyful noise? Is it joyful noise? I got into it. I, I started whistling everywhere I went. I was the true story, true story. I was in America and I was preaching a major camp meeting in, in Louisiana the other day. And I walked in and they was having one of those woo woo woo, you know. Y'all don't know what the woo woo. They were having one of those really, you know what I'm talking about when you know those, those everybody's in it and everybody in the only in South 
part of America that I guess you see that and I was so wrapped up in it in the building, huge building packed out and I came and sat down right where you're sitting and first thing I knew I let out a Said, that's your last time here if you're going to do that <laughs> and I, I whistled and I saw I saw the general moderator on the other end of that long row and he called for the head ushers and he was going <laughs> and I found out later he was saying there's somebody trying to destroy the service whistling find him and get him out of the church and I was about to speak for him Hallelujah. How did I get on that? Amen. <laughs> Prayer. <laughs> the Word. Fellowship. Fear. I do know that. Fear. Now, when it says that, that, that fear came upon them, now, now you've got, you can't write this off as bad because it said fear came upon them and miracles followed the fear. Anybody but me hungry? No, no, not that. No. <laughs> the whole back row said, That's me, that's me. I'm, a... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm glad Paula's not here. This would be this. <laughs> she would not like this at all. I, I, hungry to see the manifestation of the miracle working power of God. I hope I don't make you uncomfortable, but I believe God still does miracles. I believe the greatest miracle of all is the miracle of salvation. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was dead, but now I'm alive. That's a miracle. But I believe there are miracles of healings. I have seen healings. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. I've seen miracles of financial manifestation. I, I have seen miracles of domestic proportion where homes are put back together. I don't know about you. I'd, I'd like one more time to see the church when we come together that the world would see that God is still in the miracle business. And it said they continued in the Word and prayer and they continued in fellowship, but they also continued in, in the fear of the Lord. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I don't mean by fear trepidation. <sighs> See, there's a lot of people preach a God that he, oh, you got to be afraid. No, 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 no. Our God is a loving and a kind God. He said, come boldly before the throne of his grace, asking what you will, and he will give you the desires of your heart. When I'm talking about fear, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about being, I'm not afraid of God. But I reverence God. See, there used to be a reverential fear in the church. When we came to church and we said, this is God's house. I, there's some things that I won't do here that I'll do out there because this is dedicated to Him. Why do you do it? Because you're afraid to pastor? I, I love Pastor Renee. I'm not afraid of him. Not afraid, I'm not afraid of Pastor Jennifer. But I don't do those things because of fear of the system. There are things that I don't do because I reverence God. I want Him See, see I'm, I'm amazed. I wonder if God manifested Himself anthropomorphically. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be something? You'd blink your eyes and God would assume this anthropomorphic form and stand in front of us. I, I, I wonder what you'd do. I heard one guy on the radio. He said that he just goes in the presence of God and demands. Now I'm going to tell you what, he's a good man, but he, he needs to read the book. I said he needs to read the book. When God's presence is manifested, I don't, I don't want to jump up and give God a high five. I recognize He is omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent and He's thrice holy and He's endless, and He's depthless, and He's boundless, and He's everlasting Father, and He's Prince of Peace, and He's El Shaddai, and El Adonai, and He, he is <coughs> Jehovah. 
when we, you know what God said to me about this? Is it all right to just preach a general talking message this way? And do you know what God said to me about fear? I really believe it was God that spoke to me, and I'm very careful to say if God said. But God said to me when I was looking at this thing, fear, He said, if my people feared me more, they would fear Satan less. If we could grasp how wonderful and majestic and powerful and glorious our God is, that I honor and rever Him, I would have no reason to fear what Satan can do. For greater is He that is in me. Did you feel that? Greater is He that is in me than He that's in the world just want to touch these. Can I touch just a couple of more? The word, prayer, fellowship, continue in fear. Continue not just in fellowship, but in relationships. Everything God does, He does on a relationship basis. Everything that God does, He does on a relationship basis. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Relationship. See, we need to understand God wants us to be in relationship, not just, not just fellowship. We can fellowship without having relationship. Does anybody believe? You, you understand that? I fellowship with people I have no relationship with. But let me tell you what I found out. Relationship is the, is the bridge God uses between us to bring great things to pass when we enter into a relationship with one another. When, when, when you know my deepest hurts and you know what makes me happy. And I know what, what, what is your, your strength. And I know the disappointments that you've had. And yet, because we're in relationship, I would never ever allow anything I know to hurt or to touch that sore spot. Because we walk in relationship. It said they continued from house to house breaking bread. We need to continue. See, church don't need to just be in church. It should be house to house. In fact, the building block of the church is the home. There's an institution God loves more than He loves the church. And can I come back and preach that sometime? <laughs> it really did because He established it 4,000 years before He got around to establishing the church. And, and He, in that first establishing of that institution, was the sole priest, the sole guest, and the sole witness of the first church. And that was the church between a husband and a wife. See, relationships so important. I, I, if, we, if we understand that God wants us to have relationships, that, that's why I, I, was, I was telling Pastor, we was talking, we haven't had a chance to get together, and I like that because then I don't know what's going on, and I, I can just preach and take my freedom, and I haven't heard anything. But, but you need to understand, we have a relationship. You may not have seen me or recognized me, but I'm not going anywhere. 22 years, I, I'm here to lay my ministry to say, let me, let me be a part of this ministry. And, and I believe the same way this ministry has come to say, let, let us be a part together that we can build the kingdom of God. And I believe what's happening in this wonderful body is that there are relationships that, that go stronger than flesh and blood relationships. Well, I guess that... I mean that. I mean that. Uh, your, your pastor, Sister Nolan. <laughs> your sister? Sister Nolan. I have a close relationship with her cousin. He's one of the best buddies I've ever had in all the world. He's weird. You can tell him I said it. Of course, I'm not. And uh, I can tell you this. If he were to call me today, and my flesh and blood brother call me with an equal need, I can tell you where I'd go. Because there is a relationship in Christ that supersedes even flesh and blood relationships. Continue. One, one last thing. Continue in contentment. See, we as Christians ought to be content. I, I don't mean satisfied. Are you still with me? Can I have, can I have three more minutes? Can, I'm, not, I'm not talking about being satisfied. I'm talking about being content. That scripture said, they ate their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. That's in the King James. Does that, does that make any sense to anybody? It doesn't to me. 
Never did. I read that for 40 years. They ate their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Yeah. Okay. What does that mean? What, what, what is that? But if you go back and you look at the Greek and you see that, what it means is they ate their meat with contentment. Nobody's shouting yet. I, I, I don't have anything to shout over. I don't know. What are you talking about? You ever have one of those dessert bar deals? And uh, there'd be more, or those dinner on the grounds things where you have those. And y'all have those up there all the time. And there's just food everywhere. And you go, whoa, man. That's, we feed the whole nation if it show up. Hallelujah. And then and you rejoice because there's an abundance. But then what if you went up there and there was not enough to go around? What would you do? Well, this scripture says you would rejoice. Because you see, our God, His greatness is not dependent upon what I have or I lack at this moment. Wow. Wow. God has blessed me in 42 years of ministry. I, I can tell you, if you know any atheists, I'd love to meet them. I'm, I'm still looking for an honest atheist. I've never found one. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. They're usually angry about something. But I'm, I, I need to tell every atheist you know, I am their worst nightmare. Everything they say God don't do, God has done for me. He gave me life. He's placed food on my table. Gave me a wonderful family. There's, there's not been a desire that I've had in, in the Word. I'm not talking about just some outlandish. I'm talking about according to the Word. That He hasn't met abundantly. And I can stand and say He is able... But you see, there's one thing to rejoice in abundance. But when the abundance is not there, do I still realize that He's still God? Brother Silcox, I'm sick and my healing hasn't come. Rejoice. And be exceedingly glad. He's still God. The healing will come. The miracle will take place. I believe that. But what we must do like they did, they praised Him in the good times. And they praised Him in the bad times. Because He's still God. He's God when there's no... What's that thing that's coming through here today? It's a hurricane where we come from. That typhoon over here. He'll, he'll be God with there and when, God, when that thing's gone. He'll be God when you've got everything in the world you need and He'll be God when you don't know where, how, to, how to, to, to put the next foot in front of the other. He says, in all things, be content. And then, the last thing, and that's the introduction. <laughs> and he said they continued in praise, because contentment leads to praise. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Have we forgotten to continue in praise? Lift up holy hands without wrath or doubt. Praise the Lord, all you land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Know you not that He is God? It is He that has saved us and not we ourselves. Have we, have we really understood that our purpose is to praise, to worship, to glorify, to verbalize, to, to lift up our hands, to, to shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph, to, to dance before the Lord? I, I know, I know some of you are saying, wait a minute, you're getting weird now. We're not going to be doing that shouting and dancing stuff. I'm not asking for an emotional response. But I want to tell you what, to those that would say, I don't praise because I'm the quiet type, I would suggest maybe you're not. <laughs> I don't know. We have a thing in America where if you send in a little thing to Publishers Clearinghouse Sweepstakes and they draw your name, you win $10 million. I don't know anybody who's ever won it, but there's a, that's what they say. And I have people that say, Pastor Silcox, I'm the quiet type. I don't, I don't raise my hands. I don't, I don't voice praise. I'm dignified. <laughs> that guy comes walking in here today and has a ticket with your name on it saying you've just won $10 million. And you're going to sit there dignified? Nah. No way. <laughs> You're going to turn flips down the aisle. You're going to do things that you're going to be embarrassed for for weeks on end after that. 
and it's okay. Because you've got to understand we are a triunity. We are spirit. We are soul. We are body. We have a body. That's the coat we live in. We are spirit or, or we have a, a soul which is our minds. But we also have a spirit and we must meet God on an emotional basis. And I believe that. I'm not talking about weirdness. But I'm talking about the fact that He can touch us emotionally in praise and worship. And if I could come back, I'd tell you, if you don't think that this continuing is important, read starting with that 47th verse. By the way, that last part of Acts should be a part of the third chapter of the book of Acts because immediately, immediately, the author goes in from what to continue in to what continuing will bring you. And he tells the story of Peter and John who are walking in fellowship to the house of prayer that they might study the Word of God, that they encounter a need, and because they continued, Peter could come back and look upon the man lame. Can I suggest one other thing to you? While you're continuing all those things, let's continue to look. We don't look anymore, folks. Oh, we look, but we don't see. Do you know the... And, and, and I am closing, believe it or not, I am. Do you know the, the number one paid job? If you, want, if you want to get really rich and you're a young person, you want to go to school and study something that will make you really rich in America, you know what one of the, the highest paying jobs in America today is? It's a position called a Q psychologist. By the way, you could get a job here doing that. Mickey Mouse will pay you lots of money. <laughs> Disney will pay you lots of money as a, as a Q psychologist. Your job is to learn how to get people through lines, to get them through events, to get them out while you have them there, fleece them, take everything they've got, and have them to leave saying, I can't wait to get back in that line again, and let them take everything I've got. And it was wonderful, wasn't it? That's what a Q psychologist does. That he does it. It's so prevalent that in America... I have a background there. I can tell you that I don't have a background in Q psychology, but in social psychology and human relations. I can tell you that uh, if you go to work for a major bank in America, they will tell their tellers, do not make eye contact. Look at the top of the people's heads. Because if I make eye contact, I make a commitment to you. And if you don't believe it, you go into your teller tomorrow and you start to, to give her your deposit and she says, how are you doing? Say, I'm glad you asked. And I, I want to talk to you about it. And, and, and you'll find out she didn't want to know. <laughs> if we're not careful, if we don't continue in these things I talked about, Peter and John, they looked upon the man in need. I love what you do here, and I, I am through. That a couple of times during the service, you say, turn around and greet the people. But in greeting, would you, would you do me a favor? Would you look? The windows of the soul are the eyes. Every one of us walks into a church and many times we walk in carrying heavy loads that we cannot hardly bear. And we put on our, our Sunday clothes and we put on our painted grin. And, and we don't want to be a burden to anybody. But when we meet the conditions of continuing and then we look and we can look past the superficial and see the need that we might be able to bring the answer to that particular person because we've been in the Word, because we've been in prayer, because we've been in fellowship, because we've been in reverence, because we are content and we're giving God all the praise. Father, I thank You. Lord, I'm sorry that my style is so simple. I'm, I'm sorry, God, that there is nothing that I have to say that is so, so wonderfully profound. But God, I believe with all of my heart that You've raised this church up. You brought it to such an hour as this. Thank You, Lord, for its glorious past. I stop now and I give praise for every sacrifice.
I give praise for every prayer. I give praise for the word. I give praise God for the fellowship. I give praise for the contentment. And I give praise for the praise. But Lord, we cannot rely on yesterday. <coughs> Today we have to determine what tomorrow holds. And that we have to launch out with joy unspeakable and full of glory, saying what brought us here will carry us on through. And we shall continue in the Lord. And we'll be careful to praise you in Jesus' name.